Um, I think it's recording. Does it look like it's recording? It's recording. Okay, good. All right, folks. So book 24 of the Odyssey, obviously, like I said, he's, he's going to meet his dad um, and, and have that reunion and the suitors are going to come chasing him. But also we have this weird scene that it's going to sort of open up with where all the dead suitors are going to be taken by Hermes down into the underworld. And a number of the ghosts that Odysseus saw are going to see them and they're going to be like, what happened to you guys? Right. And then they're going to be like, well, Odysseus killed us. And they're going to be like, aha. Right. Like, so this is weird scene. If you ever want uh, absolute proof that the overarching narrator of the Odyssey is a uh, omniscient narrator, the fact that he can go into Hades without any character being present and tell us what's going on there is, is clearly evidence that he's an omniscient narrator. All right. So uh, let's read book 24. Uh, and uh, at the end of this, maybe we'll have a little bit of time to work on, on some of the other things that we've got going on. Um, meanwhile, the suitor's ghosts were called away by Hermes of Silene, bearing the golden wand with which he charms the eyes of men or wakens whom he will. He waved them on, all squeaking as bats will in a cavern's underworld, all flitting, flitting crisscross in the dark if one falls and the rock hung chain is broken. All right, so uh, you get the sort of image of the suitors as bats, it's another simile, like, you know, they're, they're sort of like winged rats fluttering around. Um, let's see, where was I? Uh, so the faint cries, with faint cries, the shades trailed after Hermes pure deliverer. He led them down the dank ways over the gray ocean tides, a snowy rock past shores of dream and narrows of the sunset in swift flight to where the dead inhabit wastes of asphodel at the world's end. Crossing the plain, they met Achilles' ghost, Patroclus and Antoclus, then Ajax, noblest of the Greeks after Achilles in strength and beauty. Here the newly dead drifted together whispering, then came the soul of Agamemnon, son of Atreus, in black pain forever, surrounded by men at arms who perished with him in Aegisthus's hall. Achilles greeted him. Now, we've heard all these stories from the Land of the Dead chapter. I don't know if you remember all of these characters, but you can go back and look them up if you need to. Achilles, of course, is the, the great warrior from uh, Greece, and he, he's going to greet Agamemnon, um, who was king of the Greeks in that battle. My lord, Agamemnon, we held that Zeus, who loves the play of lightning, would give you length of glory. You were king over so great a host of soldiery before Troy, where we suffered, we Greeks. But in the morning of your life, you met that doom that no man born avoids. It should have found you in your day of victory, marshal of the army in Troy country. Then all Greece would have heaped your tomb and saved your honor for your son. Instead, piteous death awaited you at home. And Atreus' son, Agamemnon, replied, Fortunate hero, son of Peleus, godlike and glorious, at Troy you died across the sea from Argos, and around you Trojan and Greek peers fought for your corpse and died. A dust cloud wrought by whirlwind hid the greatness of you slain, minding no more the mastery of horses. All that day we might have toiled in battle had not storm from Zeus broken it off. We carried you out the field of war down to the ships and bathed your comely body with warm water and scented oil. We laid you upon your long bed and our officers wept hot tears like rain and cropped their hair. Then hearing of it in the sea, your mother Thetis came with nereids of the great wave crying, unearthly lamentations over the water and trembling gripped the Greeks to the bone. They would have boarded the ship that night and fled except for one man's wisdom. Venerable Nestor, proven counselor in the past. Nestor, if you recall, was the guy uh, Telemachus went to see at Pylos, like at the beginning of the story. So all of these things are connected. He stood and spoke to allay their fears. Hold fast, sons of the Greeks, lads of Argos. His mother, it must be, with the nymphs, her sisters, come from the sea to mourn her son in death. Veteran hearts at this contain their dread, while you at their side, sorry, while at your side, the daughters of the ancient sea god wailed and wrapped ambrosial shrouding around you. Then we heard the muses sing. Uh, that's probably a death song. Uh, what is it? Let's look up. Uh, yeah, a, a dirge of lament, a death song. I was right. Um, a threnody in nine immortal vo voices. No Greek there but wept such keening rose from that one muse who led the song. Now seven days and 10. 
Seven nights and 10, we mourned you, we mortal men. So this is the entire story of Achilles funeral. Why it's here, I don't know, but Homer had to put it in here somewhere, I guess. Uh, with nymphs who know no death. Before we gave you to the flame, slaughtering longhorn steers and fat sheep on your pyre, dressed by the Nereids and embalmed with honey, honey and unguent in the seething blaze, you turned to ash. And past the pyre, Greeks' captains paraded in review in arms, clattering chariot teams and infantry. Like a forest fire, the flame roared on and burned your flesh away. Next day at dawn, Achilles, we picked your pale bones from the char to keep in wine and oil. A golden amphora your mother gave for this. Hephaestus's work, a gift from Dionysus. In that vase, Achilles' hero, lie your pale bones mixed with mud. Patroclus's bones who died before, sorry, with mild Patroclus's bones who died before you. And nearby lie the bones of Antoclus, the one you cared for most of all companions after Patroclus. We of the old army, we who were spearmen, heaped a tomb for these upon the forehead over Helly's waters to mark, to be a mark against the sky for voyagers in this generation and those to come. Your mother sought from the gods magnificent trophies and set them down midfield for our champions. Often at funeral games after the death of kings, when you yourself contended, you've seen athletes cinch their belts with trophies, went on view. But these things would have made you stare, the treasures Thetis on her silver slippered feet brought to your games. For the gods held you dear. You perished, but your name will never die. It lives to keep all men in mind of honor forever, Achilles. As for myself, what joy is this? To have brought off the war, foul death Zeus held in store for me at my coming home. It just this and my vixen cut me down. He really hates his wife. I guess she killed him, so there's that. Um, while they conversed, the wayfinder, that's Hermes, came near, leading the shades of the suitors overthrown by Lord Odysseus. The two souls of heroes advanced together, scrutinizing these. Then Agamemnon recognized Amphimedon. Amphimedon's one of the suitors that Odysseus killed. Son of Menela sorry, son of Melanius, friends of his on Ithaca, and called out to him, Amphimedon? What ruin brought you into this undergloom? All in a body picked men and so young. One could not better choose the kingdom's pride. Were you at sea aboard a ship and Poseidon blew up a dire wind and foundering waves or cattle raiding were you on the mainland or in a fight for some stronghold or women when the foe hits you to your mortal hurt? Tell me, answer my question, guest and friend. I say I am of yours or do you not remember I visited your family there? I came with Prince Menelaus, urging Odysseus to join us in the great sea raid on Troy. One solid month, we beat our way, breasting south sea and west, resolved to bring him round, the wily raider of cities. The new shade said, this is the suitor responding. Oh, glory of commanders, Agamemnon, all that you bring to mind, I remember well. As for the sudden manner of our death, I'll tell you of it clearly first to last. After Odysseus had been gone for years, we were all suitors of his queen. And she never quite refused nor went through with a marriage. Hating it, ever before bent, sorry, ever bent on our defeat. Here is one of her tricks. She placed her loom, her big loom, out for weaving in her hall at the fine wrap of some vast fabric on it. We were attending her and she said to us, young man, my suitors, now my Lord is dead. Let me finish my weaving before I marry or else my thread will have been spun in vain. This is a shroud I weave for Lord Laertes when cold death comes to lay him on his bier. The country wives would hold me in dishonor if he with all his fortune lay untrod. And we had men's hearts. She touched them, we agreed. So every day she wove on the great loom, but every night by torchlight, she unwove it. And so for three years, she deceived the Greeks. But when the seasons brought the fourth round, as long months waned and slow days were spent, one of her maids who knew the secret told us we found her unraveling the splendid shroud. And then she had to finish willy nilly, finish and show the big loom woven tight from beam to beam with cloth. She washed the shrouding clean as sun on, on the moonlight or moonlight. Then heaven knows from what quarter of the world fatality brought in Odysseus to the swineherd's wood far up in the island. There his son went too when the black ship put him ashore from Pylos. The two together planned our death trap. Down they came to the famous town, Telemachus long in advance, 
We had to wait for Odysseus. The swine herd led him into the manor later in rags like a foul beggar, old and broken, propped on a stick. These tatters that he wore hid him so well that none of us could know him when he turned up. Not even the older men. Actually, I want to pause here. Anybody noticing that Odysseus' strategy for retaking his house is very similar to his strategy for taking Troy? You know, the Trojan horse. There, there's a nice similarity here to what Odysseus does at his own house and how he took Troy. And I think it's coming across here. And Agamemnon's going to appreciate that. That's who the story is being told to, the king who, who fought at Troy. That night, the mind of Zeus beyond the storm cloud stirred him with Telemachus at hand to shift his arms from the Megaron to the storage room and lock it. Then he assigned his wife her part. Next day, she brought his bow and iron axe heads out to make a contest. Contest there was none. That move doomed us to slaughter. Not a man could bend the stiff bow to his will or string it until it reached Odysseus. We shouted, keep the royal bow from the beggar's hands. No matter how he begs, only Telemachus would not be denied. So the great soldier took his bow and bent it for the bowstring effortlessly. He drilled the axe heads clean, sprang, and detached arrows on the door sill. I'm sorry, decanted arrows on the door sill, glared and drew again. This time he killed Antinous. There, facing us, he crouched and shot his bolts of groaning at us, brought us down like sheep. Then some god and his familiar went into action with him round the hall, Af after us in a massacre. Men lay groaning, mortally wounded on the floor, smoke, and the floor smoked with blood. That was the way our death came, Agamemnon. Now in Odysseus's hall, untended still our bodies lie, unknown to friends or kinsmen, who should have laid us out and washed our wounds free of the clotting blood and mourned our passing. So much is due the dead. But Agamemnon's tall shade, when he heard this, cried aloud, Oh, fortunate Odysseus, master mariner and soldier, blessed son of Laertes, the girl you brought home made a valiant wife, true to her husband's honor and her own, Penelope, Icarius's faithful daughter. The very gods themselves will sing her story for men on earth. Mistress of her own heart, Penelope. Tyndareus's daughter waited too, but how differently. Clytemnestra, the adulteress, waiting to stab her lord and king. He's so bitter. That song will be forever hateful. A bad name she gave to womankind, even the best. These were the things they said to one another under the rim of the earth where death is lord. Leaving the town. All right, so now we can leave the underworld and go back to Odysseus who's leaving his, his town and going to see his dad. Leaving the town, Odysseus and his men that morning reached Laertes' garden lands, long since won by his toil from the wilderness, his homestead and the row of huts around it. Where field hands rested, ate and slept indoors. He had an old slave woman, uh, Sekel, keeping house for him in his secluded age. Odysseus here took leave of his companions. Go, make yourselves at home inside, he said. Roast the best porker and prepare a meal. I'll go to try and find my father. Will he know me? Can he imagine it after 20 years? He handed a spear and shield to the two herdsmen, and in they went, Telemachus too. Alone, Odysseus walked the orchard rows and vines. He found no trace of Dolius and his sons, nor the other slaves, all being gone that day to clear the distant field and drag the stones for a boundary wall. But on a well-blanked plot, Odysseus found his father in solitude, spading the earth around a young fruit tree. Hey, you want to go check on Trent? Um, he wore a tunic, passed and soiled, and leggings. So this is this is the description of Odysseus's father. Remember that Odysseus's father was an Argonaut, right? Like he he was on the, the ship the Argo and did all of that journeying. Now this is what he looks like as an old man. He wore a tunic patched and soiled and leggings, oxide patches bound below his knees against the brambles, gauntlets on his hand and on his head a goatskin cowl of sorrow. This was the figure Prince Odysseus found, wasted by years, racked, bowed under grief. The son paused by a tall pear tree and wept, then inwardly debated, should he run forward and kiss his father and pour out his tale of war, adventure, and return? Or should he first interrogate him, test him? Better that way, he thought. Why does Odysseus always have to test everybody he meets? Like, he's like, oh, I've got to gotta pretend to be somebody else every time. Like, this doesn't make sense to me. Why, why does he walk up to his dad and be like, I'm going to pretend to be somebody else? Like, why? I guess it's just who Odysseus is. Uh, first, draw him out with sharp words. Trouble him. His mind made up, he walked ahead. Laertes went on digging, head down by the sapling, 
stamping the spade in. At his elbows then, his son spoke out. Old man, the orchard keeper, you work, you work for, you work for is no townsman? That's gotta be a typo. Uh, a good eye for growing things he has. There's not a nursling, fig tree, vine, stock, olive tree, or pear tree, or garden bed uncared for on this farm. But I might add, and don't take offense, your own appearance could be tidier. Old age, yes, but there was the score and the rags to boot. It would not be for sloth now that your master leaves you in this condition, neither at all, because there's any baseness in yourself. No, by your features, by the frame you have, a man might call you kingly, one who should bathe warm, sup well, and rest easy in age's privileges. But tell me, so Odysseus is like, hey, old man, why are you wearing rags when you look so kingly, right? Like, obviously, this is Odysseus knows this guy, Blair, he used to be the king of Ithaca, you know, all that kind of stuff. Let's see. Um, but tell me, who are your masters? Whose fruit trees are these you tend here? Tell me if it's true this island is Ithaca, as that fellow I fell in with told me on the road just now. He had a peg loose. That one couldn't say a word or listen when I asked about my friend, my Ithacan friend. I asked if he were alive or gone long since to the other world. I could describe him if you'd care to hear it. I entertained the man of my old lad when he turned up there on a journey. Never had I a guest more welcome in my house. He claimed his stock was Ithacan. Laertes, Archaeosides, he said his father was. I took him home, treated him well, grew fond of him, though we had many guests, and gave him gifts in keeping with his quality. Seven bars of measured gold, a silver wine bowl, filigreed with flowers, 12 light cloaks, 12 rugs, robes, and tunics, not to mention his own choice of women trained in service, the four well-flavored ones he wished to take. His father's eyes had filled with tears, he said. You've come to that man's island right enough, but dangerous men and fools hold power now. You gave your gifts in vain. If you could find him here in Ithaca alive, he'd make return of gifts and hospitality as custom is. When someone has been generous, but tell me accurately, how many years have now gone by since that man was your guest? Your guest, my son, if, in, if he indeed existed, born to ill fortune as he was. Ah. Far from those who loved him, far from his native land, and some sea dingle fish have picked his bones, or else he made the vultures and wild beasts a trove ashore. His mother at his byre never bewailed him, nor did I his father. Nor did his admirable wife, Penelope, who should have closed her husband's eyes in death and cried aloud upon him as he lay. So much is due to the dead. But speak out, tell me further. Who are you? Of what city and family? Where have you moored the ship that brought you here? Where is your admirable crew? Are you a peddler put ashore by foreign ship you came on? Again, Odysseus had a fable ready. Yes, he said, I can tell you all those things. I come from Rover's Passage, where my home is. And I'm King Alwo's only son. My name is Coleman. Heaven's power in the westward drove me this way from Sicania off my course. My ship lies in a barren cove beyond the town here. As for Odysseus, now is the fifth year since he put the sea and left my homeland, bound for death, you say. Yet land birds flying from starboard crossed his bow, a lucky augury. That's a like a augury. Um, it's um like a sign from the gods. So we parted joyously in hope of friendly days and gifts to come. A cloud of pain had fallen on Laertes, scooping up handfuls of the sunburnt dust. He shifted it over his gray head and groaned, and the groan went to his son's heart. A twinge pick, prickling up through his nostrils warned Odysseus he could not watch this any longer. He leaped and threw his arms around his father, kissed him and said, oh, father, I am he, 20 years gone, and here I've come again to my own land. Hold back your tears, no grieving. I bring good news, though we still cannot rest. I killed the suitors to the last man. Outrage and injury have been avenged. Laertes turned and found his voice to murmur. If you are Odysseus, my son, come back. Give me some proof, a sign to make me sure. His son replied, the scar then, first of all, look here. The wild boar slashing tusk wounded me on Parnassus. Did you see it? You and my mother made me go that time to visit Lord Autolochus, her father, for gifts he promised years before on Ithaca. Again, more proof. Let's say the trees you gave me on this riveted plot of orchard once. I was a small boy at your heels, wheeling amid the young trees. Well, you named each one. 
You gave me 13 pear, 10 apple trees, 40 fig trees, 50 rows of vines. We promised two, each one to bear in turn. Bunches of every hue would hang there ripening, weighed down by a god on a summer's day. The old man's knees failed him. His heart grew faint, recalling all that Odysseus calmly told. He clutched his son. Odysseus held him swooning until he got his breath back in his spirit and spoke again. Zeus, father, gods above, if you hold pure Olympus, if the suitors paid for their crimes indeed and paid in blood, but now the fear is in me that all Ithaca will be upon us. They'll send messengers to stir up every city of the islands. Odysseus, this is the talk of the blood feud that we mentioned earlier. Odysseus, the great tactician answered, courage and leave the worrying to me. We'll turn back to your homestead by the orchard. I sent the cow herd, swine herd, and Telemachus ahead to make our noonday meal. Conversing in this vein, they went home, the two together, into the stone farmhouse. There, Telemachus and the two herdsmen were already carving roast young pork and mixing amber wine. During these preparations, the sequel woman bathed Laertes and anointed him and dressed him in a new cloak. Then Athena, standing by, filled out his limbs again, gave girth and stature to the old field captain, fresh from the bathing place. His son looked on in wonder at the godlike bloom upon him and called out happily, Oh, father, surely one of the gods who are young forever has made you magnificent before my eyes. This is sort of an echo of what happened with Odysseus, right? Like he looked like a beggar with all the rags on and all of a sudden he took a bath and Athena's like, Shazam. And he's like, oh, I'm a... Same thing happens to his dad, Laertes. He washes and takes his rags off and then he looks um, younger and, and healthier. Clear-headed Laertes faced him saying, by father Zeus, Athena, and Apollo, I wish I could now be as once I was commander of the... Septhalians, when I took the walled town Nereus on the promontory. Would God I had been young again last night with armor on me, standing in our hall to fight the suitors at your side. How many bees I could have crumpled to your joy. So Laertes is like, I wish I was there to kill them suitors, those sons of, you know, like, so he's sort of, he's got that, that idea going on. By now, old Dolius appeared in the bright doorway with his sons, work stained from the field. Laertes' housekeeper, who reared the boys and tended Dolius in his bent age, had gone to fetch them in. When it came over them who the stranger was, they halted in astonishment. Odysseus hit an easy tone with them, said he, sit down and help yourselves. Shake off your wonder. Here we've been waiting for you all this time and our mouths watering for good roast pig. But Dolius came forward, arms outstretched and kissed Odysseus' hand and wristbone, crying out, dear master, you returned. You came to us again. How we had missed you. We thought you lost. The gods themselves have brought you. Welcome, welcome, health and blessings upon you. And tell me just one thing more. Penelope, does she know that you are on the island or should we send a messenger? Odysseus gruffly said, old man, she knows. It is for you. Is it for you to think of her? So Dolius quietly took a smooth bench at the table. And in their turn, his sons welcomed Odysseus, kissing his hands. Then each went to his chair beside his father. Thus our friends were occupied in Laertes' house at noon. Meanwhile, so we're gonna shift locations here. We're gonna go back into Ithaca where the fathers of the suitors are gonna find out about what's happened. To the four quarters of the town, the news ran. Bloody death had caught the suitors and men and women in a murmuring crowd gathered before Odysseus' hall. They gave burial to the piteous dead or bore the bodies of young men from other islands down to the port, thence to be ferried home. Then all the men went grieving to assembly and being seated rank by rank grew still as old Eupithius rose to address them. Pain lay on him like a brand for Antinous. Eupithius is Antinous's father. So you can figure that if Antinous was a bad guy, his dad is probably also a bad guy, right? So um, Eupithius rose to address them. Pain lay on him like a brand for Antinous, the first man that Odysseus brought down and tears flowed for his son as he began. Heroic feats that fellow did for us, Greek friends, good spearmen by the shipload he led to war and lost, lost ships and men and once ashore again killed these who were the island's pride. Up with you, after him, before he can take flight to Pylos town or hide at Elis under Epian law. We'd be disgraced forever, mocked for generations if we cannot avenge our son's blood and our brother's. Life would turn to ashes, at least for me. Rather be dead and join the dead, I say. We ought to follow now or they'll gain time and make the crossing. So he's like, look, this Odysseus guy, I know he was the king, but like all the guys he took with him to Troy, they're all dead. And so all the greatest uh, 
soldiers of his generation are dead and he's the only one that's returned and now he's going to kill all the greatest soldiers of the next generation and you're going to let him get away with this let's go get him before he gets away no telemachus is still alive um his, yeah they did but so did so did you in the bathroom so you know <laughs> uh his appeal, his tears moved all the gentry listening there, but now they saw the crier and the minstrel come from Odysseus's hall where they had slept. The two men stood before the curious crowd and Medmen said, now hear me, men of Ithaca. When these hard deeds were done by Lord Odysseus, the immortal gods were not far off. I saw with my own eyes, someone divine who fought beside him in the shape and dress of mentor. It was a God who shone before Odysseus, a God who swept the suitors down the hall, dying in droves. And this pale fear assailed them. And next they heard again the old forecaster. That'd be somebody who reads omens, somebody who's like a holy man. Uh, have a Theseus Mastorides, I don't even know how to say that. Mastorides. Alone he saw the field of time, past and to come. In his anxiety for them, he said, Antikins, now listen to what I say. Friends, by your own fault, these deaths came to pass. You would not heed me or the captain mentor, would not put down the riot of your sons. Heroic feats they did, all wantonly riding a great man's, raiding a great man's flocks, dishonoring his queen because they thought he'd come no more. Let matters rest. Do as I urge, no chase, or he who wants a bloody end will find it. So this guy's like, look, the gods wanted this to happen. If they didn't want this to happen, it wouldn't have happened. And your sons deserved it. And if you go chasing Odysseus, you're going to die, right? Like that's sort of his his view of this. Yeah, yeah. But he's he's saying Zeus. Uh, Vengeance would be his, he thought, for his son's murder. But that day held bloody death for him and no return. At this point, did I skip something? No, I did. I skipped something. The greater number stood up shouting, I, but many held fast, sitting all together in no mind to agree with him. Eupithius, that's Antinous's dad, had won them to his side. They ran for arms, clapped on their bronze, and mustered under Eupithius at the town gate for his mad foray. Vengeance would be his, he thought, for his son's murder, but that day held bloody death for him and no return. That's clear foreshadowing what's going to happen to Eupithius, right? Uh, at this point, Querying Zeus, Athena said. So now all of a sudden we're going to Olympus um, and we're going to get a, a snapshot of what the gods are thinking. Oh, father of us all and king of kings, enlighten me. What is your secret will? War and battle? Worse and more of it? Or can you not impose a pact on both? The summoner of cloud, that's Zeus, replied, my child, why this formality of inquiry? Do you not plan that action by yourself? See to it that Odysseus on his homecoming should have their blood. Conclude it as you will. There is one proper way, if I may say so, Odysseus's honor being satisfied. Let him be king by a sworn pact forever, and we, for our part, will blot out the memory of sons and brothers slain. As in the old time, let the men of Ithaca henceforth be friends. Prosperity enough and peace attend them. So, what Zeus is planning to do is sort of uh, wipe them, yeah, wipe the memories of everybody who had a son who was a suitor. Um, yeah, very much men in black, you know, like that, that sort of an idea. Obviously, um, men in black may be referencing this rather than the other way around. Um, let's see, where did I leave off? Athena needed no command, but down in one spring she descended from Olympus just as the company of Odysseus finished wheat crust and honey wine and heard him say, go out someone and see if they are coming. One of the boys went to the door as ordered and saw the townsman in the lane. He turned swiftly to Odysseus. Here they come, he said, best arm ourselves and quickly. All up at once the men took helm and shield, four fighting men, counting Odysseus, with Dolius's half dozen sons. Laertes armed as well, and so did Dolius, gray beards. They could be fighters in a pinch, fighting their, fight, fitting their plated helmets on their heads. They sallied out, Odysseus in the lead. Now from the air, Athena, Zeus, Zeus's daughter appeared in Mentor's guise with Mentor's voice, making Odysseus's heart grow light. He said to put cheer in his son. Telemachus, you're going into battle against pikemen where hearts of men are tried. I count on you to bring no shame to your forefathers. In fighting power, we have excelled this lot in every generation. 
said his son, if you are curious, father, watch and see the stuff that's in me. No more time talk of shame. And old Laertes cried out, yeah, what a day for me, dear gods, to see my son and grandson by in courage. Wait, Laertes, he's not dead? No, he's not dead. He's Odysseus' dad. So this is a great family scene. We're having a battle, and we got, like, the grandfather, the father, and the son, like, all lined up for battle in their armor. Like, this is the ultimate Greek patriarchy moment here, if you will. Three generations of, of men. Yep. Um, Athena halted near him and her eyes shone like the sea. She said, and this is the father of Laertes, so whatever. Laertes, dearest of all my old brothers in arms, invoke the gray-eyed one and Zeus her father. Heft your spear and make your throw. Power flowed into him from Pallas Athena, whom he invoked as Zeus's virgin child, and he let fly his heavy spear. It struck Eupithius on the cheek plate of his helmet and undeflected the bronze head punched through. He toppled and his armor clanged upon him. Odysseus and his son now furiously closed, laying with broadswords hand to hand and pikes. They would have cut the enemy down to the last man, leaving no one survivor, had not Athena raised a shout that stopped all the fighters in their tracks. No hold, she cried. Break off this bitter skirmish, end your bloodshed, Ithacans, and make peace. Okay, so <laughs> we only have one death in this fight, and it's um, Antinous' dad. And Antinous' dad is killed by Odysseus' dad. So there's a nice harmony there, too, right? Like Odysseus kills Antinous, Odysseus' dad, Laertes, kills um, Eupithius. And uh, there's, there's sort of a, a harmony. The bell's going to ring, isn't it? Oh, man, I had no idea it was going to end. Um, Again, all right, we're almost done. We, we can finish this. Uh, did have a child? No, we didn't. He was trying to marry um, Penelope, so he had no wife. Uh, their faces paled with dread before Athena, and swords dropped from their hands unnerved to lie strewing the ground. At the great voice of the goddess, those from the town turned fleeing for their lives, but with a cry to freeze their hearts and ruffling like an eagle on the pounce, the lord Odysseus reared himself to follow, at which the son of Cronus, dropped a, a, sun, a thunderbolt at Zeus, smoking at his daughter's feet. Athena cast a gray glance at her friend and said, son of Laertes and the gods of old, Odysseus, master of landways and seaways, command yourself. Call off this battle now, or Zeus who fews the wide world may be angry. He yielded to her and his heart was glad. Both parties later swore to terms of peace set by their arbiter, Athena, daughter of Zeus, who bears a storm cloud as a shield though she still kept the form and voice of mentor. And that's the end. So they wipe the memories of the suitors. Odysseus gets to be king. Everything's good. He's going to walk off with his oar and make peace with Poseidon. And everything's going to be fine. Let me stop the recording here. Um, <laughs>